Tonight, we take a closer look at APC's presidential campaign manifesto and consolidation of Buhari's legacy achievement. And special assistant to the president, Mohammed Buhari, on media and publicity, Femi Adishina, says rising insecurity is no longer an issue in Nigeria. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakon. The All Progressive Congress APC presidential candidate Bola Tinubu in his 80-page manifesto unveiled in Abuja has vowed to end the controversial petrol subsidy gulping trillions of naira annually and also to tackle forex crisis hindering the economy if elected president next year. Tinubu said his objectives is to foster the new, so new society based on shared prosperity, tolerance, compassion and unwavering commitment to treating each citizen with equal respect and due regard. In response, the spokesperson of the People's Democratic Party PDP Presidential Campaign Council, Dino Malai, accused the All Progressive Congress, the APC, uh, and their presidential candidate, Tinubu, of plagiarizing the campaign manifesto and slogan of the late MKO Abiola. The statement was, however, rejected by the APC's Presidential Campaign Council. While well, joining us live to discuss this is Assistant Principal Spokesman of the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC Presidential Campaign Council, Ajuri Ngalale. It's good to have you join us, Ajuri. Great to be with you, Marianne. Thank you for Great. having me. It's an 80-page uh, manifesto mm -hmm. with all the controversies surrounding it and all the people who are accusing your party of plagiarizing it. Let's start by looking at some of the key areas and why... Um, Many people would say that it's plagiarized. Would you like to first speak about it? Yeah, I think I think it's important not to even lend credence to unfounded allegations. You know, uh, it has already been clearly established in the public domain that it was not plagiarized. Independent authorities, publishers, have come together to agree that it was not plagiarized. It was just simply a statement. It's just like saying. Uh, that the president has 100 wives. Anybody can say that, but we all know that it's falsehood. So there's no need to harp on it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Let's start by looking at education. This is something that many Nigerians have spoken of, mm -hmm. especially with the strike action that took place for eight plus, almost eight months. With you know the end, Asu staying at home, mm -hmm. asking the federal government, you know, meet their demands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Um, we also know that there are twenty million plus children who are out of school as we speak. Before your principal took office. It was about 11, 10 million roughly out of school children, but now it's more than doubled. What will your manifesto or how will the manifesto address the issue of out of school children? And of course, the deficit that we have in terms of schools, teachers. We remember that uh, at the time in Sokoto, the governor, El had right. said that teachers had not necessarily been trained up to the level where they should be. Hence, you know, yeah. the the level of education that we have. So what does the manifesto hope to address in those areas? Thank you very much, Marianne. First and foremost, uh, obviously, as, as the population grows, uh, you're going to have a, a, a situation where some of these troublesome trends uh, are continuing because these kind of social remedies have not been put in place in the states where these, are more, these uh, cultural factors are more prevalent. Uh, there are regions, obviously, where, and I've been very open about this, I believe the President has been very open about this when he addressed the National Economic Council some months ago, uh, that the, the state governors, particularly in, in the northern part of the country, have a lot more work to do uh, in, in clamping down on uh, scenarios where you have a gate man who is earning 15,000 naira or less in a month but has 12 children that he's not catering for. These are very serious cultural problems that need to be addressed and that factor into the out-of-school problem that we're talking about. Now, uh, with that said, uh, it's also to, uh, un important to understand that when we talk about education, particularly primary education, getting these young kids into school, we're talking about the constitutional prerogative of the state governments. We know that this is not a federal government uh, issue. The presidential campaign manifesto is not for the APC governors that are running. It's for the APC presidential candidate who will be the chief executive officer of the executive branch of the federal government. And so the, the, the issue now is about how do we, when we're talking of out-of-school children, how do we uh, incentivize 
uh, find creative ways of incentivizing states to do the things they should have been doing without the federal government begging them to do them. Of course, we've had in place uh, the, the UBEC scheme for a long time, universal basic education uh, scheme, uh, where we have offered counterpart funding for uh, the provision of primary uh, education facilities and the like. Uh, many states have not even accessed that as we speak, which speaks to the will of some states uh, across party lines, by the way. So, look, uh, it's important that we understand who's responsible for what. And then, uh, in addition to that, though, to answer your question, uh, now that I've clearly shown that this is a, more of a state issue, is that the, the, under the campaign manifesto of His Excellency Asiwaji Bola Ahmed Tinubu, his plans are very, very clear uh, in terms of what he's trying to bring to the table that's different from what anybody else has ever done. Uh, which is first and foremost, he's establishing a special, pre uh, upon his election uh, in February, uh, uh, by the grace of God, he will establish a special presidential committee on education that will be comprised not just of former, uh, former and current academicians uh, and, and, and public sector officials in the education sector, but really for the first time, bringing in captains of industry in the private sector uh, at, at an elite level, CEOs of major companies across, uh, you know, critical, um, uh, you know, uh, labor-intensive sectors in manufacturing and agriculture and construction and the like, bringing them to the table and having them directly inform the reform, the, 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 the reconstruction, as it were, of curricula nationwide. And the reason why he's doing that is so that we can more specifically tailor the uh, curriculum uh, for the curriculum that our children will be studying toward the actual needs in the knowledge-based 21st century glo uh, global economy. So you have these. Uh, so you will not have a situation where people are graduating, they're getting certificates, but then they go through the NYSE and afterwards they have no job. Now we're going to tailor a curriculum to give them the kind of skills they require within these academic institutions, so that even if there's no available job in the formal uh, economics fair. They will now be equipped to be able to even uh, go into their own entrepreneurial, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, pursue those aspirations. The second thing, which is very important, is there's going to be a major emphasis on vocational education. We want to emphasize in this country that uh, we can no longer look at education as simply uh, a means to a certificate at the end of it. We cannot say to our children that if you don't go to college, because this is the problem we have in the country, is if you don't go to university, you're a failure. If you're not a, a scientist, a doctor, a lawyer, or this or that, you're a banker, you're a failure, and all of that. That's the mentality of most parents in this country across the country. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a failed mentality, it's archaic. What we are saying is if you look at the developed economies around the world, what you're seeing is the blue collar jobs are some of the highest paying jobs in the world right now, where you have people who go to vocational technical schools, where they learn hands-on skills, whether it's plumbing, whether it's robotics, whether it's design thinking, whether it's software. I mean, there's so many aspects to it, what you can get into. So what His Excellency Asiwaju Bola Metinubu is now saying is that across every state of the federation, he's going to establish a vocational education center of excellence where young people irrespective of whether they had gone to secondary school right uh, they will now have access to these uh, institutions where they can be trained in hands-on uh, blue-collar uh, you know training curricula that will enable them to be involved uh, in in so many different entrepreneurial exercises as they develop their careers and skills so we have uh, I think the ITF we've had these vocational training centers over the year over the years not we've quite had, the, we uh, have, uh, with we've what we're talking about about. About no, no, not, not no, no, compared, not the way, get, not designed the same there. way. Your government yes. has been there. Your your principal, the person who's running for this office, has also been a friend of this government. You're telling me that these ideas could not have been shared. This government that is in power has come up with all kinds of ideas as to how we can improve the loss of young people. So we're going to wait till 2023 for that to be done by Asiwaju. No, we, we have cannot, to understand. We cannot explore that now. See, may, may and I monies explain, have always been yes. allotted to training people in vocation, in ICT, mm -hmm. but then something different, you're going to pull a rabbit out of a hat? No, uh, uh, Maria, no, we're, we're not, I'm not into theatrics, I'm into developmental conversation. What I'm saying to you right now is that when we talk about the issue of education, one of what we're trying to look at is say, look, President Muhammadu Buhari, we're not saying he has not done well. We're not saying that he has not uh, done his best. But we also know that there are several training institutes where uh, uh, corrupt politicians and some officials have done the wrong thing. And they have, been, they have been taken in by the EFCC. They have had assets recovered from them. And they have gone through prosecution. You cannot put that on the president. What, the president cannot well, be the, the head. I'm, I'm coming, please. I, I would so like to land. I allowed you him. to land your question. I want to land my answers. Mm. 
So the, what I'm saying is that he cannot be the head of every institution. There's a reason why you have ministers. There's a reason why you have CEOs of agencies. But when those, uh, those officials are not doing their jobs well, it's his responsibility to ensure that they're either removed, replaced, uh, or if they have done something wrong, they should be, uh, you know, the, the law should be enforced. And that is what he has done. That's relative to training. But we're not talking about the same type of process. We're talking about a, a totally different uh, uh, you know, apparatus that takes into account the partnerships required with the state and local governments. It's not just a minister sitting somewhere in an office in Abuja determining who is going to be trained and who's not going to be trained. That's a totally different approach from what we're taking in collaboration with the private sector. So does that mean that the Buhari administration has failed in taking that approach and that's why Bola Tinubu wants to come No, abso place? absolutely. But this is the kind of myopic thinking we want to avoid. The idea that because somebody has a fresh idea, it means that somebody else has failed. No. These are two different men who have two different sets of ideas. President Muhammadu Buhari brought in place so many different reforms. I mean, we're fixated on education. There's so many issues, to, areas to look into. But if, but if you look at across the board, the various uh, sectors, uh, look at the manifesto. In page five, we talked about uh, security, the security plans, which I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, the first thing that was there was praising President Muhammadu Buhari for the reforms he brought in place in terms of massively arming not just the Air Force, but also the Navy with new landing ship tanks, new uh, battleships, uh, the Air Force with new fighter jets, gunship laden helicopters, drones that we're now manufacturing locally in Nigeria, the army with new light arms, uh, new locally made uh, mine resistant uh, vehicles, armored personnel carriers. These are things that we were importing 100% before. We're now uh, manufacturing them within this country because of the, the moves and policies of President Mohamedou Buhari. So what we're saying is in agriculture, same thing, page 27 of the manifesto, we first gave credit to President Mohamedou Buhari for putting us in a position where we went from being the largest importer of rice in Africa in 2015 to now today being the largest producer of rice in Africa to giving over 1 trillion naira to over 3 million farmers nationwide, which has allowed us to massively substitute the imports of several food items across value chains. These are things How that, that the, the, point, the, point, though, the point that I'm making to you is for those, of, uh, of, of the, for those who have been in the media space attempting to create an impression that because uh, His Excellency Asiwaju Bola Metinubu is bringing new ideas and you know, kind of uh, new approaches to governance, that that now equates to Mr. President failing. That's a nonsensical idea. And I think we can be more sophisticated in our thinking to understand that you have a president who has, has his own history, his own uh, notion of how to tackle problems, and then you have a new candidate. And that's why we elect new governments. Let's talk about health care. Sure. Um, it's interesting that in the space of a year plus, we've had so much brain drain mm -hmm. in the health sector. Mm -hmm. um, again, this might not have been part of the three key things that the Buhari administration campaigned upon, mm. but then we're seeing more and more people flee from you know, Nigeria right. to other parts of the world. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, we also see that life expectancy in Nigeria has gradually dropped to you know, its lowest ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think the, the, I think it's gotten to 52 or 54, which is really appalling, mm -hmm. especially if you live somewhere in Lagos. Um, what does the, what, what's in your manifesto that's going to address all of this? Because it's very important. When I was growing up, you would, for every kilometer, you would see a health post. That's no longer the case. Mm. What's the government going to be doing Well, well uh, this is, again, this is another area where it requires a lot of uh, nuanced appreciation of the, the constitutional configuration ab around healthcare delivery and service, and service provision is where you have uh, basic health care we know is the bulk of health care service delivery in the country and in most countries. Uh, we know that that, again, is a prerogative of the state governments. If they're not making the investments, there's really very little any president can do at the federal level because it's a constitutional provision and prerogative of the states. But the, the, what, we, what we can do and what His Excellency Aswaji Bola Metinubu is promising to do in his manifesto is creating a program of incentivization uh, to counterpart fund uh, states and local governments uh, to construct not just, I think this is uh, probably one of the innovative approaches, is to construct not just brick and mortar uh, primary health care centers like we've had in the past, uh, but now evolving into some of the mobile, mobile primary health care service clinics where you can actually move them from location to location where the needs may arise and all of that. The commitment of His Excellency Asuwaju Bola Metinubu is this 
that every Nigerian must be within three kilometers of a primary health center, whether it is the uh, brick and mortar uh, static uh, edition or whether it is the mobile clinic edition. That is a commitment that he is making uh, to deliver in the manifesto. Second, uh, secondly, and I think this is very important, he is, he is also uh, putting in place the same uh, counterpart in incentivization mechanism uh, to assist the states uh, to totally reconstruct and, re uh, and refurbish in terms of uh, refurnishing uh, general hospitals in every local government area of the Federation. He has said that he's going to establish a new tertiary healthcare institution in every state of the Federation through that same incentivization me mechanism. And then finally, he said that in every geopolitical zone of this country, there is going to be a world-class uh, world uh, center of excellence where you're going to have uh, essentially all the services under one hub in every geopolitical zone of the Federation. His vision is not just to stop, uh, you know, kind of in education, we call it brain drain. In healthcare, we, we call it uh, medical tourism. He's not trying to stop the outflow of medical tourism. He's, he's trying to just, he's not just trying to stop it. He's trying to not only stop it, but also reverse it in such a way that Nigeria would actually be the, 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 the recipient nation of other countries healthcare service delivery deficits so that instead of a, a Ghanaian not finding the service in Ghana and going to England they can now come into Nigeria and into these centers of excellence and have ample opportunity to choose which institution uh, they want to pay into it's good for the Nigerian economy and it's good for the health uh, of the nation and obviously the healthy worker is the most productive worker which has multiplying economic impact on the economy this is the vision of his excellency Asiwaju Bola Metinubu in healthcare uh, according to his manifesto and I, I think it's important for us to specify these things because ultimately that's how you that's how Nigerians will hold him to account mm -hmm. after he's elected president great um, I just want to backtrack a little so mm -hmm. it's 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 enough it's enough for us to talk about these establishing of health centers state-of-the-art right. governors do this all the time right but when they fall ill they travel including your principal mm -hmm. who's gone back and forth will he start with himself when it comes to making sure that he reduces medical mm -hmm. tourism because he was governor of this state and, I mean, in the time that he was governor, I'm sure he had built a few state-of-the-art, uh, and we've never really seen him use those facilities. So, again, this might just be another campaign slogan of, oh, we're going to make sure that, you know, the health facilities are good enough and we would not fly out. But well, then, uh, well, I we think see that happen every day, including Mr. President. Yeah, I've heard your question or, or statement or observation. What, what, I, what I would just say to that, and this is the same observation that was raised uh, to me today at TVC, uh, is that, look... Uh, I don't know about every spokesperson, I don't know about every official of government, but I speak for myself when I say that I have no problems at all acknowledging where uh, we have not been able to achieve what we hope to achieve in certain sectors. And there are other sectors where we have totally outperformed even our initial expectations. In infrastructure is a major one. Uh, of course, we haven't talked about that yet much. But uh, when we talk about health care, I think there are a few things to factor in. You have two uh, uh, economic recessions. One of them was global, right? You have a once in a century global pandemic that essentially shut down the world for several months and most economies had not recovered even after two years, right? Major impacts, not just on revenues, but on uh, how you're going to, which, which, which programs and projects you're going to continue uh, constructing in view of the limita limited resources. We all saw the bar uh, barrel of oil go down to $10 per barrel during that time. These are things you cannot plan for when you're running for president in 2015. You cannot say in, 2019, in 2020 there will be a historic once-in-a-century pandemic. Nobody can plan for that. So when these things happen, you have to, you have to address your priorities. I think it's, it's fair to say uh, that when it comes to uh, health care uh, infrastructure, the states, when the pandemic happened, that are mostly responsible for providing the infrastructure and healthcare that we're talking about, really did pinch that part of uh, budgetary provision and focused more on roads and some of the other priority projects that they held. That's their prerogative. Whether it is a good decision or a bad decision is something that we have to talk to our governors about. But um, in terms of the president and him going to travel and all of that, uh, I think it's absolutely true that there's still a ways to go. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have to start. And I believe if you look at Lagos State, 
His Excellency Asuwajibola Metinubu it had created the conditions for this state to be the state where you have state-of-the-art private hospitals that people are coming in from Kenya to come and use. Look at Reddington, and I don't want to uh, be uh, advertising for anybody, we'll but you, if you we'll look at you se when se you're done. Uh, several other, uh, there are several hospitals that inter the international uh, residents come and and get their uh, health care at. Even even it. in by the way, we should acknowledge that the Can't vice president. Use it? Why we he we use should it? no, but we they should. Are of international we should. Credibility. I, I'm coming. We Why? should hold on. We, there are two things here. First, let me address that. First of all, His Excellency the Vice President Yemi Oshibajo got a very critical leg well, surgery done. One person. Well, it's one very he's important. Not, he's not I'm, running I'm coming, for president. I'm coming, Marianne. I'm coming, Marianne. He did. He did do it. But it's unprecedented. Before he did it, of oh, well. whether you want to acknowledge it or not, he did do it. Then, in addition to that. It is not up to us to determine who, who uh, where somebody will, ha will have their, uh, their relationships with their doctors. I'm coming, please. The relationship that President Mohamed Buhari has with his personal doctor, who is based in London, is something that predates his, his, his run for the presidency. This is something that has gone back decades. That's a very convenient no, excuse. No, it's not a convenient excuse. It's reality. It's There's a difference. Excuse. No, it's, it's not convenient. Miriam, 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 what do you want? No, patient. no, see, I'm sorry not to give you the answer you want. I, I'm, no, 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 I'm, what not, you, I'm, not, I'm not asking no, you. No, 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 no. I'm not asking no, you to you, tell me no, what I want no, to hear. No, see, no, Miriam, Miriam, you're interrupting me. I'm sorry, but I'm not. You're not sorry because you continue to do it. You're telling me that your candidate wants to Why are you interrupting me now? So Why are you interrupting me? So example means that you have to stop Why from are you where interrupting you stand. Me now? Please answer my question. I will do so if you don't interrupt me when I do so. Because there's a guest and there's a journalist. You're the journalist, I'm the guest. I'm supposed to be able to talk as the guest. Well, all right. So now, this look, question. this is how it works, all right? Look, you have a decades-long relationship with your doctor okay. before you entered office. Will you now say that because you ran for president, that your doctor, who is based in London, whose facility is in London, that now by, by, by force, by mandate, you are now forced to, you know, the person who has all your sensitive details, knows your medical history, you should now start afresh with somebody new based on the fact that you are now the president. I don't think that that's logical. His Excellency Asiwaji Bola Metinubu has a personal relationship with a doctor in the United States. That is his personal decision. That's not a political decision. So if he decides to consult with somebody who does not live in Nigeria, that is his prerogative. If he's now asking the Nigerian taxpayer to fund that service or to fund the logistics to go and engage in that service, then Nigerians have a right to say, look, that's not right. But that is not what is happening. So I'm sorry not to, not to say, oh, oh, it's unfortunate so that the president that does this. I won't do that. I mean, but our president... Whenever he goes, I think we're wasting a lot of time on, well, a, but, on an issue but, but that is not important. I, I just need you to answer this and then we'll move on. You're saying that the president is using taxpayers' monies and us asking that question is not valid? And using taxpayer money, how? Is it, are you talking the about. The medical treatments abroad, who pays for it? First and foremost, see. Who see, pays for it? No, see. First and for that, first of all, I don't have the details of, of which of which right, let's, let's which entity on. pays for. I don't know if it's his personal account or if right, it's his, if on. it's his daughter or is I don't know. Let's move on. So so no, no listen 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 because you raised the question and I'm going to answer you. I've answered you about the issue of uh, his medical tourism and all of that. That is, uh, that's his decision to engage with any doctor that he had had for decades. That's his decision. What I am saying to you is that that does not now mean that any candidate uh, running for president in the future is mandated to have a new relationship with a doctor he had not had experience with. I think you get the logic, but I think you're more... You're more, uh, you know, focused on trying to get some entertainment value in the conversation. But let's move on to the critical issues. Let's talk please. about. Um, let's talk about infrastructure. Yes. Let's talk about. I mean, your gov, your principal, mm -hmm. Mr. President, um, right. has always um, spoken about the fact that he's done really well in mm -hmm. terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But let's look at the manifesto yes. of Bola Tinubu and how it's going to build on those gains. I'm sorry, can you refer? Is We're there, talking is about infrastructural development. Uh, generally, not, generally, not specifically. Yes, yes, from a oh, federal level. Well, because we see that every time the Ohio administration is talking about the gains or its dividends of democracy, one of the major aspects is, is, infrastructure. is infrastructure. How yeah, well, does Balatinibu intend to build on those gains? Oh, well, I think it's just a very straightforward thing. If you look at railways, obviously, with the work that's been done with the 326 kilometre Wari, Ajeo Kutai, Takpe rail line. Uh, the, obviously, the Lagos, uh, Abel Kutai, Badal rail line is not a stranger to you. Uh, the key now is to continue where President Mohamedou Buhari left off. And this comes back to the original conversation we were having, is this notion that 
if you want to do something that you must try as much as possible to divorce yourself from the previous person, that really is an administratively silly approach. What he's going to do is he's going to take the best of what has happened and he's going to uh, make, first of all, accelerate the reforms and then make whatever adjustments or amendments he needs to make uh, to the other areas. I think the other aspect of it is that when you look at the AKK, for example, that's the first uh, foundation line. That's the Ajeo Kuta Kaduna Kano gas pipeline, for those who don't know. That's going to be the foundation line of the Trans-Sahara uh, gas pipeline, which is going to take Nigerian gas for the first time into Western Europe through the Algerian pipeline system. Uh, Asiwa Jibola Metinubu has committed to ensuring that that gas is moved uh, out of the Niger Delta uh, and he builds on the AKK uh, through the Sahara. So he's intent on making sure that the existing gas pipeline networks and plans that are on, on ground already, that they are implemented to the letter. Uh, so that's that. And then if you look at the plans around NLNG train 7, going into NLNG train 8 to expand our gas production, these are all ongoing plans that he is going to continue to build on. If you look at aviation, Already, His Excellency Mr. President has put in place five international airports, uh, obviously five of which uh, were not in place before 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, we had met them at an average completion percentage of 11%. We've taken them, uh, by the end of his administration, would have taken them to completion. Uh, obviously, I think the important thing here is understanding that this election is not between President Mohamedou Buhari and His Excellency Asiwaji Bola Metinubu, the election is not between uh, Bola Tinubu and uh, Jesus Christ or the Prophet Muhammad. It's between Asiwaji Bola Metinubu and Al Haji Atiku Abubakar for most intents and purposes. I'm sorry to those who are into the Labour Party's movement, but we'll see what happens in the election. But we believe that these are the two major forces. So what we are saying is we would love for a situation where you would ask questions about what the PDP's record is. Because the truth is that if you well, ask... the PDP has not held power for the past seven uh, no, years. No, I'm, I'm, I'm coming, please, if I learn my point. Well, you're the telling reason, me what to ask you. No, so no, I'm no, I'm saying, no, I'm ask saying... The I'm, no, I'm not telling you. No, I'm not telling you what to ask. I said it would be great if you did ask these questions because... The, 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 whether you say they have not been in government for seven years or not, they still govern for 16 years before then. And that 16 years actually matters because you grew up in those 16 years and so did I. So what they did or didn't do actually had an impact on the nation well, that we but, live in today. You, so your, no, I'm, your I'm, principal I'm, acts that you are you are the master me. of interruption. Well, but you're asking me questions. I'm going to give you answers. No, I'm not. I, 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 I have not asked, I have not that asked you a question. Vote for him I have not he asked you a question, Mary Ann. I have not asked you a question at all. as journalists to ask ask you what the PDP you, will do. Wait, wait a second. Well, that, wait you're a not second. a PDP representative. You just, you just, I can't be asking you, you that you question. Just, you just said that I asked you a question. I did not ask you a well, question. Well, go ahead now. now. Now, with what I was saying, look, is that people that did not even build a single airport, not one in 16 years, with double the time and double the wealth, not a single railway was concluded in those 16 years. They cannot name 100 kilometer plus uh, Federal Expressway that they started and completed in 16 years with double the wealth and double the time, right? Not one major gas pipeline artery or one major refinery or one major this or that, just name it, major, uh, name it now. They cannot, that's a major problem. So my point in, in making this statement is not to lambast the PDP. I'm just telling the truth. I'm not insulting anybody. So, but what I'm saying is the, the point in saying so is that this is who we're running against in the election. So what we are saying is that the progressive movement is united. Whatever President Mohamedou Buhari has accomplished, which is so much across the sectors, we are not only owning it, we are proud of it. And whatever we're going to do on top of that, on top of that successful foundation he has laid for us, we are going to do, we're going to accelerate the reforms and we're going to make sure whatever value addition we can make in terms of modification, we're going to do that. And that is the simple position. Let's talk about security. Mm -hmm. This is um, it's something you and I had your a tete -a -tete. favorite topic on this program. No, 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 we had a tete a tete um, uh -huh. before we went on air, and you 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 had you know a lot to say. Yeah. But let's talk about the fact that when your government came in, it talked about right. putting an end to Boko Haram. But now we don't have just Boko Haram. It's mm -hmm. become a hydra-headed monster. It's become um, the bandits. It's become the unknown gunmen. It's become become all kinds of things. You know, across the federation. I always say. Um, if you toss a pen, wherever it faces, there is some form of crisis or insecurity. We saw what happened in Anambra and all the, the, the assassination attempts on senators, members of the National Assembly. We've also seen what happened in Abuja, the security alert that was put out by 
um, you know, the U.S. and the U.K., even though um, the information minister called it a clickbait. I'd hope that you'd be able to explain to us what that meant. Yeah, but then, sure, sure. In 2015, Boko Haram was the major issue. Right. Now we're dealing with many things. Mm. Um, what exactly um, will the Asiwaju government be doing? Because as we speak, we're getting ready for an election uh, season. Also, <laughs> with the flooding, uh, there's a lot to you know worry about in terms of you know how people are going to be safe and yeah, look, to what, vote. But, what, but yeah, with I, okay, all that's happened now, is coming. Uh, just hold on. Okay. With all that's happened now, uh, yes, um, things de deteriorating to this point. Does it not make the Jonathan government look like a saint as opposed to what we have now? Well, that's that's uh, that's quite a, 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 a pretty good marketing moment for the Jonathan administration. I, I would just say this: if you look at um, the wide raft of what we face. Look, I was a reporter in this country going to the sites of all these terror attacks. I was in Abuja at the this day bombing. I was in Nyanya when the motor park was exploded by Boko Haram. I was in, I was in the, 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 the Catholic church that was exploded on Sunday just on the outskirts of Abuja. I was there. Bannock, same thing. So I have an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about how bad things were and how, how things are today. Uh, you know, I always, I always marvel at the ability of some people to glamorize the things that, that uh, are, are wrong in the country for, for narrow political ends. What I've always said is that if you look empirically at what has happened in this country from 2015 till today, uh, as against what was happening before then, I'll remind you very quickly before I go into what we've done, that from 2011 to 2015, I didn't even mention the UN bombing, which was even the most catastrophic, uh, is this. You had young boys in boarding schools across the north uh, waking up to terrorists entering their rooms with no light. They were having their throats slit. In the morning, you will have 80 boys dead on their bunk beds across boarding schools in the north. People forget that that was going on. You had bombings in markets in Kaduna and Kano and Kebi and Jigawa. There was no, no, no state, Sokoto, no state in the north where you were not every weekend. I'm not saying something that happened every month. Every weekend, there was a new bombing of a new market. In fact, the incumbent president was almost killed in Kaduna by the same groups. The entire city of Abuja was a checkpoint. You were here. I'm sure you were there at that time, or at least saw it. I was there. So the notion that we have not had a single bomb attack in Abuja from 2015 to today, knock on wood, it continues. We have not. To the idea that, oh, good luck, Jonathan, now looks so good, I, I think is, is almost offensive, uh, given the facts. Then on top of that, the Boko Haram that you're talking about controlled uh, about a third uh, of, a, of, of the northeast of this country at the worst point in time. Uh, at the time we took over, they controlled several local governments. They were administering taxes and governing uh, over spaces. Emirs had been run out of their thrones to IDP camps. Local government chairman, IDP camps. That's what was going on. Meduguri Airport was closed for three years. It has been opened since 2017. It has not been closed since then. Now. Uh, I, 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 I situate all of this to say that today Boko Haram controls zero territory in this country. The Iswap faction that we, that we all talk about, uh, uh, that was controlled by Abu Musab al-Banawi, the commander al-Banawi is now dead. Under the uh, leadership of this commander-in-chief, the military removed him from the battlefield. Abu Bakar Shekau, the original Boko Haram, the commander that was mocking the man that you're praising now, good luck Jonathan, in public on video, he's now dead under this commander in chief the the now you now I say that did he die? yeah no but I, so now so now he, he you know he died once and he's fully dead and everybody recognizes that he's dead so not only is he dead the people he was fighting with are dead too so there's really nothing to talk about now oh, if this, you, no sorry, but no I'm, you I'm talking about Boko about? Haram okay. now in addition to that in addition to that you made the, the, the very interesting, in fact, I could see almost glee on your face as you were saying, if I spin this pen, almost everywhere there's a problem. I will correct that notion. If you remember, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're wrong to state that banditry was not a problem before. Banditry was a major problem under Good Luck Jonathan. It's just that Boko Haram was such a terrible problem then that nobody talked about the bandits that were kidnapping and your killing people. Your government campaigned. No, no to I'm, put an I'm end coming. To I'm coming. I'm so coming. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand why you keep going back to Jonathan. No, no, no. Because you're, you're, no, you're, you're quite. 
Marianne, to Marianne, to Marianne, to Marianne. To no, it's because of the a jungle. Whole train see, full no, of people were see, kidnapped. See, see, and it took months Marianne, to get I them allowed out. you when you when you started. See, I'm sorry, but no, I have to you, ask this no, question. No, 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 no. You're not asking a question. You're making a statement. Why do you keep going back to the jungle administration? No, no, Marianne, Marianne, this is unprofessional now. To do something. Well, you're here to defend the government, so help me understand why you keep going back to the good government. No, 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 no,
uh, have, have, what have you done to increase that, to create that enabling environment? Because we're seeing that, like you said at the beginning, right. we don't just have to go to school to be doctors and nurses. Yeah, right. Because mm -hmm. we have to look at other mm, entrepreneurial know, opportunities. Yes. So, yeah. Um, what has the Buhari government done in terms of the ease of doing business, mm -hmm. raising the stakes, and of course, how right. does your candidate intend to improve on that? Thank you very much. I, I think I think it, it's well known at this point. I don't want to belabor our successes in the ease of business, but. Uh, of course, the World Bank has actually stopped the official ease of doing business rankings. They stopped it, I think, one or two, or I think maybe a year ago or so. Around the pandemic time, they stopped that. So there's no official ranking anymore. But uh, during two out of the last three rankings that came out under the World Bank, they named Nigeria as one of the top 10 most improving nations in the world in the ease of business. Uh, that's something that we're proud of, but it didn't come as a result of them liking the president's face. It came as a result of them coming into the country and making a very, uh, a very verifiable, tangible assessments of what it is that we had done. So we put in place things like uh, the, the, uh, uh, the automation of processes of business registration at the Corporate Affairs Commission, moving the process from uh, uh, sometimes three, four months, and that's usually with bribe and go at the CAC and all of that man-to-man -man interaction. We automated all of that, made it now to where you can uh, register your business name within 48 hours. In addition to that, we put in place judicial uh, modifications and interventions where the chief judges of the two major commercial capitals of this country, Lagos and Kano, uh, were able to essentially uh, put in place small claims courts uh, that would uh, expedite the time frames on business-related conflicts, legal conflicts between various parties to ensure that, uh, you know, wherever there's any kind of a judicial process, that it can be shortened uh, for the sake of uh, the ease of business in the country. And there are so many other ones. But now, you ask the question about what is Excellency Asuwaju Bola Tinubu will do uh, moving forward. One of the major aspects is we're focused on two things. One, rural youth employment and urban youth employment. The urban youth employment is really going to be a function of two major things. One is going to be the, 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 the industrial, uh, industrial policy and the vocation centers. Because the vocation centers, we are anticipating that the vocation centers of excellence that we talk about are going to be the, 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 the uh, hubs that will actually nurture these young people that will go into, uh, into impacting the industrial policy. The industrial policy essentially creates uh, these these competitive the local competitive it, it basically leverages on local competitive advantage of the various geopolitical zones in items that they have raw products that they can, that they can add value to. So, for example, in the north central where you have a lot of solid minerals, and in the northwest places like Zamfara where you have lots of solid minerals, we want to create major uh, geopolitical uh, zone uh, zonal hub where we're going to effectively tailor our our, our, our private sector collaborations around that particular item so that people can have an opportunity to not just be a part of the primary part of getting the raw commodities out of the ground, but also part of the value additives uh, uh, aspect of refining uh, gold and the like. We the have to go. Oh, we have to we go. Have to oh, go. there's so we many things. Well, um, always I wish you could have gotten into housing. <laughs> housing was a big uh, one. Well, we will, we, you will come I'll back. I'll come back. Definitely. I'll come back. There's a lot to unpack. It's Absolutely. an 80-pager. So Absolutely. Course. Well, Adiri Galali is, of course, the assistant principal spokesman of the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC Presidential Campaign Council. Always a pleasure. Uh, we hope that you come back and we'll do some Thank more you, fighting. I look forward to the next unpacking. fight. It's great. Thank <laughs> right. you. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll be taking a look at the discussion with Tunji Abdulhamid on security in Nigeria. Stay with us.